Here we are once more in Bakewell Parish Church for another conversation with John Butler. I thought what we would do in this conversation is to try and bring uh, the focus from the bigger picture, the things that are out of reach, out of our hands maybe, or it feels that way, uh, with climate or politics or economy or many things and uh, bring it right back home to the practicalities of daily living. And one of the things that uh, most of us have to do, or choose to do, or want to do, hopefully, is a job. And uh, you've been a farmer, and you're fortunate in that it was what you loved to do. There are many of us out there who are perhaps not doing jobs they love to do and we'll touch on that later but first of all I would like you to just give us your reflections on how uh, farming uh, was a, a help to practicing the presence well long before I'd ever heard of such a thing the presence, let alone the presence of God. Yes, long before I would ever have dreamed of using such words. I was fortunate to... There have always been animals in my life and the natural seasons. My, my playmate, I only had an older sister, I was born just before the war, and there were no, almost no social life at all. We lived in the deep country, and I hardly knew what, a, what another little boy was, really, for the first seven or so years of my life. Um, So my companions were just naturally animals and the neighbouring farm next door that had all the cows, sheep, horses, chickens, the birds, the rabbits, the, the birds in the garden. We lived in a large garden surrounded by fields. There were lots more, lot, lots more wild birds then than there are today. Many, many of them have died out, the old species the endlessly uh, changing um, plants, both wild and in the garden. And I think for children it is natural to be present. You don't think much about the past and future in the first few years of your life, do you? These things come in later. For those who were uh, <coughs> don't live close to nature, often look to children to, as a demonstration of what it is to be present, just naturally present. Um, so certainly as I grew older, but even so long before I started even thinking in these terms, um, Yes, I can. I, yes, I know what I can say because when I was sent to boarding school at the age of seven and first um, met the the discomfort to me of uh, of human society, especially the 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 world of other little boys, which uh, which is which was certainly very discomforting to me as a quiet, shy, rather lonely boy, used to my own company, suddenly being expected to be interested in sport and competitive games and that, which were completely alien to me. Um, uh, my escape route was, to, it, fortunately, the, the school was in the country, was to just get as far away as I could and go back to my beloved fields and woods. So instinctively, I felt better in those situations. Um, many years later, when I began to 
um, when I was more mixed up in myself, having got thoroughly sort of <laughs> indoctrinated in the ways of society and man and with all its worries about what I should or shouldn't be in the past and the future and all that. And, uh, and then started looking to philosophy for my answers and, and discovered this little book, The Practice of the Presence of God. Well, I, it quite soon just, well, this is what I know about anyway. This is just that's natural. <laughs> I didn't need to read a book to, to uh, accept to reinforce my own instinctive feelings. But, uh, of course, I hadn't valued my own feelings. Right? I, I, they were just a, a way which I felt better, but I never really thought of it as a way of, of uh, uh, being useful in a wider field. Um, of course, I hadn't begun to think much beyond my own me world then. But gradually I began to you know, realize there were other people beside me in the world also had their problems and uh, and this little book the practice of the presence of God um, it was recommended to, to me by an old friend to read and, and uh, I began to see that this really was of great use in the human condition the, the, the mixed up problematic human condition because, of course, he just brings one back to being natural. And if you want to, one single word to sum up, sum up the human condition, it's unnatural, isn't it? That's why we're ill at ease with it. Um, and uh, spiritual practice is really all about coming back to being natural, our natural estate. Um, first of all, being present, and then, uh, um, of course, th th that can deepen and deepen and deepen to become not only the visible world, but the invisible world. First of all, through a sense of what one might almost call nature spirits, the, the, the unseen, the the, the uh, intangible sense of comfort and companionship that may come from association with nature. Um, inexplicable, maybe, but very real to those that, that know it. The sense of all rightness. However wrong everything else is, there's something immensely calming about a field of grass. Isn't there? How many people just love a lawn outside their windows? grass. I love the description of grass as the forgiveness of nature. It covers all the wounds that we inflict on the earth, doesn't it? And never criticizes us. Yes, so like with most of my spiritual discoveries really, rather than bringing in anything new it confirmed what I knew instinctively. And that's really why when anybody comes to spirit for spiritual instruction, uh, uh, any teacher can say to them, I can't give you anything you haven't already got. All I can do is, is help you to realize what's already there. And uh, regarding this practice of the presence of God, this little book was written by a, a medieval monk in a French monastery. And, um, and he was employed in the kitchen. He used to just do humdrum work in the kitchen. And, uh, and was very insistent that uh, it's of no consequence what work you do, and that often the most humble work you do is, is, is preferable, really, because it's... It's um, rather than trying to be a high-powered executive surrounded by high technology and all that, if you've just got a simple task like peeling potatoes or washing up, 
it's really much easier to keep your attention on the job. And of course it's from keeping attention on the job that that this that this these bubbles of happiness of just sheer joy in the, what you're doing just bubble up. And it's wonderful what what marvelous things it can be. Just to feel the the knife slicing through the skin of a potato. Or even more sense the sensitivity of the potato and realise it's a living creature and you as it were you know, it's like a labour of love. You just treat it with love, you hold it with love, like almost like a child, like a living thing. And uh, washing dirty plates in the same way. Everything becomes precious. The very grease on the plates becomes becomes a sort of noble, really. You are you are working with the whole thing can become beautiful. And you can't think of anything, any luxury holiday or anything that could possibly compare in its potential to give you the fullness of joy than just dipping your hands in soapy water and washing some dirty plates. <laughs> this is a very different perspective, John, to what I was expecting, but very valuable. We live in a world of what what some people called Mac jobs, uh, you know, low paid, uh, generally low paid, um, uh, and minimum hours contracts. We live in a, a world of what's called the gig economy, where you deliver pizzas on your scooter or motorbike. And the, the whole world of work is denigrated, but are you saying that it's not so much what the work is, it's your attitude to it? <laughs> well, of course, as I keep saying, this whole world that, that we've made is, is upside down. We've got it all screwed around. See, um, and the practice of the presence of God, you're quite right to pick this subject because we just couldn't be anything more important. Feet on the ground, and immediately, instead of being absent out there in the, in the airy fairy world of man's inventiveness, you're brought back here. And what do you hear? Well, first of all, there is stillness, isn't there? There's peace. And almost everybody in this crazy world, if you ask them what they want, they'll say, peace. One of the first things people will say well, my dears, you can never be closer to peace than here and now. Look, we're in it. We're held in peace like fishes in the sea, aren't we? How can one ever not be at peace unless we're not here? And again, to repeat myself, in this we gradually come to realize that the human condition is no more complicated than absent, absent from here. We're not here. And to use slightly more elaborate language, we're absent from the present. You can add the presence of God if you like. If we just come back here, immediately there's a most of our problems are gone. It's so simple. We're present. Look, there's a bit of a wind today, and the wind is slightly buffeting the church. It's absolutely lovely feeling, isn't it? You feel you're in the invisible arms of this elemental power of wind. Can you hear it, I wonder, on this video? I just, I spend hours and hours uh, sitting here in meditation. I love it when it's raining or stormy outside and the whole church creaks. And I feel like a ship, like being a little boat in a storm at sea. I just feel so safe and so comforted with these elemental powers. I like call it angelic powers, which are just, uh, you know, I'm just here. So it's, it's, it's uh, the, the, 
the potential of joy is literally infinite. If only we, we just come back here and then begin to discover what seems so in contradiction to the way that we've been brought up in this world, which, which is, I was, had my hair cut yesterday. I was sitting in the, in the barber shop looking at the magazines. There was a big fat magazine there. I was flipping through the pages, page after page of exotic pictures all over the world. These beautiful girls in their swimsuits, <laughs> exotic <laughs> um, no places were to go, all tempting us to, to go off to, somewhere else. Well, that's very nice for those <laughs> that probably get the chance till you get bored with it. Come back here. But actually, one of the features of going on holidays, because we are taken away from our from our habitual life, we actually are usually present, aren't we? Because it's a new place. You're interested in it. So you actually do look at the coconut palms and the sea and the pretty girls. And that's how you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's a great secret to be present with all these high, high powered, you know, spiritual recommendations floating around now to do this and do that. You can't do better than just be present, simply present. No need to call it clever names or just be present. And is this the same as uh, paying attention? Exactly the same. This is what the fashionable word is, mindfulness now, isn't it? It's the same thing. So whatever uh, comes to hand in your daily job tasks, um, just to pay attention and do what is in front of you. Exactly, yes. Even sitting at a computer. Not so easy, but uh, at least you've got your fingers on the keyboard, haven't you? Which is a, you can be in touch that way, but you tend to be swallowed up by what's on the screen. So it's a good idea to have breaks. But if those breaks can be attentively drinking a cup of tea, or just opening the window, or just rubbing your eyes, for example. All these things will bring a fresh reality into your life, the reality of being present. And this is very helpful, John, and very practical. You spend a good deal of time, especially the mornings, editing your books, your travel books on the computer. So you do have first-hand experience of spending some hours on a computer. So uh, what have you, I mean, this is a good chunk of your, after your morning meditation and breakfast, you're, you might spend several hours on your books on the computer. So what have you learned over the past several years about how not to lose the sense of presence when, when, when you're in the digital world? as most of us are. Well, I'm not sure that I have learned. I'm afraid I do get swallowed up by it. Um, I'd say I get lost, like most other people do. I do try to uh, be mindful of that and, and, uh, and limit the, the amount of time I spend. And on the days when I spend more, time that I should, I nearly always regret it. I feel I've just uh, lost my day, wasted it very often, watching something I didn't really want to watch, or uh, just pushing the, pushing the boundaries and, uh, um, to my uh, disadvantage. I've got a very good... I, I like to have a routine to my day. Uh, I'm, I'm quite methodical and um, and uh, I think that's very helpful in just uh, making sure you you do punctuate uh, your work with the necessary pauses. 
for exercise and uh, meals and of course above all meditation and you do go for a regular um, bike ride or in your case tricycle ride in the afternoon yes I, I find that most valuable for a get out for a couple of hours if possible and fortunately it's only a few minutes out of this little town where I, we live to get out in the country I'm among among sheep and green fields there which which always brings me back to where I feel I belong. Um, yes, I've always feel, felt that uh, the Mother Earth is the way back to sanity. <laughs> Not Netflix. <laughs> oh, I, I do enjoy it. I, I often watch something. I've got one or two favourite things that I like to look at. <laughs> Usually, nice, nice things. Of, there's one nice thing I watch on with horses and young people, always falling in and out of love. But the horses and lovely countryside keep me going. <laughs> it's sweet and harmless. <clears throat> uh, but you're always punctually back at work at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yes, I am, yes, I'm strict about that, and in, even, in, even more so in the mornings. Yes, I get up very early and I come to meditate in the church. Mm. Yes, I love that, getting the early dawn throughout the year, yes. Uh, in previous uh, conversations, you've talked uh, very affectionately about uh, manual tasks that can bring us into the presence, practicing the presence. Uh, you, you mentioned your, your mother, she, she would knit and embroider. Well, yes, it did. Uh, again, I was lucky in that being a farmer and um, I resisted all the, the machines that were then coming in and uh, continued to work with the spade and fork and hoe till the end of my working life. And uh, and loved that. Yes, I loved that hands-on feel and earth on earth on my hands. And and uh, yes, I was proud of my hands then. They were all calloused and hard and ingrained earth in them. And farmers' hands. I liked that. I loved my polished tools, the wooden handles. Yes, some of them my my uh, cousins or uncles or great-grandfathers even, generations of use polishing the wooden handles. Yes, I, I think that a great... I, 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 never, I never was convinced of the value of machinery. I think that's one more of the false gods of this age, that things have to be done for by machine rather than by hand. Where well, we're sitting here, I don't know if you can see the lovely wooden pews were carved by hand many years ago. They must have stood here for, I don't know, getting on for 500 years. Each year they're more polished by many hands. They carry a message, don't they? Something of value. People come from all over to look at them and take photographs of them, admire the craftsmanship. Yet they were just done by simple, ordinary men with a with a mallet and a chisel. Wouldn't even have had electric light, would they? They'd have used a candle at night or in daylight. And in stark contrast to that, John, we're moving rapidly, we are told, towards a world of uh, robots and uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and the dreaded, or welcome to some, algorithms which control much of our, certainly, digital life. And I'm just wondering, this, this is quite a sort of a, ri a risky area in a way, a new area of concern perhaps to uh, touch on. 
the the, um, the risk or the the threat indeed to being human by um, the encroaching digital world it's it's comparatively new in human society and I'm, I'm wondering if there's any anything positive that we can say to get some balance because it's ain't going to go away well yes i didn't of course have to cope with this as a young man it's developed um as i've grown older um and by that time i was already getting fairly well grounded in what we can call spiritual work and now I'm even more grounded in that. And I look at this, uh, this um, ever-spreading te technology from a point of view of inner stability. Through long, long acquaintance with this pr presence and being present and also through the practice of meditation I've come to realize the abiding stillness, this rock. Jesus, remember, is described as a rock, the rock of ages, which really is like an invisible rock of absolute safety and unlimited peace that becomes like an inner anchor at the center of our being and which I'm almost never without these days. So I look out from that and I look at this world. I don't like to call it crazy, really. It seems rather dismissive. I, I don't dismiss it at all. It's how it is. It's, but I look out rather with a, with a smile upon it. That it's a phenomena that comes to pass. Well, it does, doesn't it? Every new technology is superseded by another one next year. <laughs> you buy a phone or a computer and almost immediately it's out of date, isn't it? So, <laughs> in a way, it teaches us its own lesson, doesn't it? That it's a, that it's a changeable thing. And, uh, and because in our human hearts we long for, well, safety or peace, we long for something that is reliable, we can trust. Um, the world teaches us that you can't trust that. And so what do we do? We either wash around in hopelessness, or as may, very many people, especially probably young people now, are searching for, for a deeper meaning, for something that you can trust, um, for something that enables us to cope. Well, thank God for that, because as the old religion is, is declining before our eyes, this new one is springing into life. And my God, it's very vibrant and alive, isn't it? Because people really want it. They're seeking seriously. Um, they want to know, what do we do? What can we do in the face of climate change, in the face of, of all this bewildering, ever clever, um, technology. Um, well, when I first started to meditate over 50 years ago, uh, it was almost unknown then and was regarded with suspicion by many people. Whatever is this alien thing? Well, now it's uh, on front cover, isn't it? It's on everybody's lips. <laughs> it's a fashionable subject, like mindfulness has suddenly sprung into people's minds. All sorts of people are learning mindfulness. The police, the army, all sorts of people are doing it. <laughs> you don't have to call it a spiritual exercise to, to discover that it works, that it's so effective. Um, you don't have to attach uh, you know, religious names to it to discover that it's useful. Um, so I'm all for this new age search that's going on and I'm, I'm glad to, in, in some ways, participate in it. Um, 
it's really <laughs> quite, quite funny how the things that, about me that were that were dismissed as as odd to say the least as a young man. <laughs> Why don't you get on with something <laughs> that's worth doing in life? It was sitting on your bottom meditating. As we suddenly now put me into the forefront of of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of attention. Uh, one can't help wondering what your dad made of your <laughs> devotion to not just farming, but the spiritual practice and what he would think now that you've got a, 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 a small following on, on YouTube. What would he say to that? Dad used to talk of this mystical nonsense that, <laughs> that I spent my life with. You see, he was quite scathing about it. Hmm. Yes, I wonder what he would think now. Well, smiling, I expect. <laughs> it's just to come back, that simple practice of being present. And you know, however bewildering this world of computers and all the rest of it is, I think instinctively we're advised, aren't we, every couple of hours or so just to step back from the thing and to just have a break. And you see, even without being told, instinctively in reaction to being stolen away, as it were, by the screen, you come back and you look around and what do you see? You look out of the window, don't you? You're suddenly reminded that there's a sky out there. Oh, you suddenly you're aware that you've got a body. You sit in your chair, stretch. Maybe get up, go to the toilet or something a drink, rub your eyes and see all these because you're giving them attention to, in reaction to being away from it, just like elastic, you, you're naturally brought back to it and so you find relief. It really is natural to be present and the further we're pulled away into being unnatural the stronger that elastic will pull us back. The more we live in a world of chaos, the more that elastic will pull us back to search for peace. In a meaningless, chaotic world, this, this instinct for meaning will drive us ever more powerfully to seek and seek and seek until we find which again, you see, is this wonderful natural balance that is there behind the scenes. You could say it's the will of God, which may be out of mind, it may be out of fashion, but it's still there. The secret power behind the scene that keeps the whole world, as, as the saying is, in God's hand. I'm reminded of some words of advice from Paul. I can't remember which letter it was, uh, where he says something like, um, do not be conformed to the pattern of thinking of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Someone asked me yesterday, she came here and meditated, and afterwards she said, how do I empty my mind? <laughs> and, uh, well, I said, well, just let go. And I looked down at the little town down below, because the church is up on a hill. I looked down, and there's the town with the... Uh, everybody thinking and worrying about things. And uh, there's the sky beyond. I said, well, let's look at the sky. You can either look at all the conf human confusion down there, or just look at the sky. And it was just as simple as that. But afterwards I thought, well, why does she want to empty the mind? What a, 
rather aggressive thing to do. Poor mind, what's wrong with it? Isn't it the mind's job to be full of things, thinking? Why do we want to empty it? Why do we always think we know better? We want to control things. Why do we... You know, <laughs> it's really funny, isn't it? We're, we're so conditioned to, to think that we know what to do and somehow it's up to us to get it right. <laughs> But there again, we're all brought up this way. This is the way the world thinks. Um, and so it's only over a long period that's, if, that if you're lucky enough to follow a good spiritual teaching, you begin to learn that it isn't about controlling things, but it, rather in being controlled, really, in being in letting the natural forces of life work on us, rather than us trying to alter them. Um, and this question, you see, how do I, the ego, empty my mind? Who and why do you want to empty it, for heaven's sake? All you've got to do is just lift, lift up your eyes. Look at the sky. But forget about the mind. The mind's only, at least the bit of mind we bother about, is only like a layer of clouds this thinky mind, or just look up. <laughs> it's just dead simple, isn't it? <laughs> you spend a lifetime trying to empty the poor old mind. <laughs> what for? It's like, you know, how do I empty my tummy or something? <laughs> because we keep on putting things into it, don't we? It's funny, isn't it? How conditioned we are. And of course, this simple practice of just being present seems absolute bonkers to us at first, doesn't it? How on earth could it? It's too simple, really, isn't it? How difficult it is just to be simple. Jesus said, didn't he, unless you become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> <laughs>